Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to COP26 and the climate crisis. My name is Edward Simpson, and I'm one of the hosts, along with Tom Tanner, for the next two days. Um, we're fortunate to be joined by Adam Habib this morning, the director of SOAS, who is going to welcome you all formally to this event. Adam. Uh, colleagues, thank you very much, uh, Ed. Uh, Colleagues, students, uh, alumni, ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, welcome to this uh, SOAS conference on the climate crisis. It's a real pleasure to invite each one of you uh, at this moment as we gear up for COP26. Uh, it's, real, uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be able to welcome all of you here, partly because what we're doing at this conference is bringing multiple stakeholders under a single banner. We kind of recognize that we have to come together as multiple stakeholders, as members of a human community to address the historical challenge of our time, how to save our planet and the human community that resides in it. Um, you know, I think the fact that we've decided to have this conference, not simply amongst academics, but academic students, NGO activists, alumni, uh, the broader public, is a recognition that we need to build a cohesive agenda. The human community, all of us in our multiple stakeholder communities need to come together. And frankly, as we come together, we need to build this cohesion based on certain fundamental foundational elements. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I did the closing address to a conference hosted by Standard Bank, which is the largest bank in Africa and so as. And at that closing conference, I highlighted four foundational elements that seem to have emerged in the conversation of that conference. And I think that those four foundational elements are useful introductory uh, principles for us to bear uh, in mind as we go over uh, these conversations in the next two days. First, I think we all have to recognize that climate change is having a, a physical impact in all our communities all over the world. Um, and it is having an economic impact. Uh, on our societies in quite serious ways. There are some parts of the world, Africa in particular, that have been minor contributors to the challenge, a mere one or 2% of global contribution. Yet, we, they and everybody else are going to have to bear the disproportionate effect of the consequences of climate change. This is why we all have to do something. The developed world, North America, Western Europe, China, but we all in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, in the island states of our globe, all of us have to do something and become part of the agenda to address climate action, uh, to climate change. The second point I want to make is that the core element of this agenda of climate action is to drive down Greece greenhouse emissions to net zero by 2050. Uh, but what all of the speakers in that conference said is you can't achieve climate action if it is not accompanied by a just transition. We need to connect the environmental and social governance agendas. Such a just transition involves mitigating the effects of human be on human beings and addressing the deep inequalities that exist in our world. It requires us to mitigate the displacement of workers that would inevitably arise, to reskill communities and to create better jobs that are equitably distributed across the world. It requires being mindful of context and recognizing that there are parts of our world, parts of Asia, parts of Africa, parts of Latin America that cannot have the same solutions as may pertain in the short term in North America 
and Western, and Western Europe. So for instance, what would be worth thinking through is how we sequence reforms and our interventions. You can't simply think of moving your entire transport networks to electrical cars in an energy deficient continent like Africa. There has to be a thinking of the contextual realities, the sequencing of reforms and the interventions that we make in different parts of the world. Three, none of these interventions are going to happen without the flow of resources from the developed to the developed world, the developing world. You know, as Nick Robbins put it, you first need to start with international public financing. And that international public financing will be required to crowd in private sector financing and investment. And this is not charity, I want to make clear. These are public goods, they global public goods, and therefore need to be resourced on an equitable basis by the global community. And that's something that needs to happen. And then finally, as if all of this is not enough, finally, it requires our behavior as human beings, our consumption patterns to change. We need to bring down the energy demands we make in the way we live, in the way we eat. Uh, and we need to transform this. We need to eat less meat and get our proteins in other ways. We will be helped in part by new technologies in food production, by new forms of agriculture but it is also requires us to change of our habits. Not only poor people to change their habits, but rich people and middle-class people, you and I in the developed world to change of our habits. That is as important. So in some colleagues, friends, um, we are in desperate need of concrete action. We desperate need of co concrete action by government, by business, scientists and academics, civil society, but by the collective of the human community. This is what is required. This is what you're going to speak about in the coming 48 hours. And those words that you articulate here and in multiple conferences around the globe, they need to be heard loudly by the political elites that meet in Glasgow in the end of this year. And particularly, I wanna say, given that this is so as, the voices of the human community in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East needs to be resoundly heard. They need to be heard like at no other time. And what needs to be said is climate action is not possible without social justice, without a just transition. So I thank you all for coming to this conference and I wish you important deliberations in the next two days. Thank you very, very much. Adam, thank you very much. I think it was an important note to start off with climate justice and just transition. So welcome everybody. Welcome to SOAS pre-COP26 briefing days. We have two days, as Adam has said, today and tomorrow. We have a highly unusual format. We have two hours, per day, and we have rapid fire presentations using Pecha Kucha um, format. For those of you who don't know it, it's 20 images or 20 slides and 20 seconds per slide. So bear with us, many of our speakers admitted this is the first time they're doing it. Normally they have 45 minutes to an hour to say what they want to say, but today they have uh, six minutes and 40 seconds or something like that. Today, our focus is firmly on showcasing and exploring climate change research mm -hmm. done at SOAS. All of our speakers are affiliated with SOAS in some way, shape or form. And then tomorrow we move out to explore work done in SOAS regions. That is, as Adam has already said, Africa, Middle East, and Asia. So as the slide has just changed, and tomorrow you see we have presentations from Bangladesh, India, Ghana, Japan, Southeast Asia, and China. 
Um, I am the director of the South Asia Institute, and along with Tom Tanner, uh, has, we've put this conference together. Tom is the chair of the Center for Development Environment Policy at SOAS. And we have multiple agendas rolled in to this short event. First of all, we wanted to work together across SOAS to bring colleagues together from different departments and centers to bring all of our climate oriented research into one place for the first time. But we also wanted to have a different kind of conference where we were working with the SOAS community. So unusually, we took, we took the step of inviting all of SOAS professional service colleagues to this event as well. We've extended the invitation to alumni and other friends of SOAS. So this is, it's a SOAS focused event that we also hope will resonate with a broader public. That's where we, we're coming from. And the format is supposed to be accessible to speak to different kinds of audiences in a, in a new sort of way. The event is going to be recorded. Uh, it is being recorded now. I wanted to bring that to you. Um, and I hope you are challenged and enjoy the presentations, but you do so with some humility, remembering that everybody only has six minutes and 40 seconds to present many years of thought. Okay, I'm going to hand over now to Tom Tanner, who I've said is the chair for the Center of Development, Environment and Policy at SOAS. Tom might want a couple of words of introduction, but his first talk is Climate Crisis 101. Why and how is SOAS engaging? Tom is our host for the morning and I am the host for tomorrow. So Tom, thank you. Thanks very much, <clears throat> Thanks very much Ed. And it looks like it's Climate Crisis uh, 1010, it seems. So I'm just gonna open with a, a brief six minutes on just where, where we stand regarding climate crisis, why it's happening, why it's a justice issue, and, and, and just briefly the ways that SOAS is engaging and why and how it might engage. Forgive me if the slide transitions are not as smooth at the beginning because he wants to do it itself. So uh, first of all, I'd like everyone just to take 15 seconds just to think about your own experience, how you've experienced climate change, your interrelationship with the subject, with the act, with impacts, with, with, with mitigating the impacts, your own footprint, canvas, you know, advocacy, that sort of thing, and situate a little bit in an, the way we think of, of SOAS is situating this this science, the indisputable fact that oops, excuse me, that climate change um, is being caused by human activities. That's the recent IPCC report has made that really centrally clear and something that whilst engaging with skeptics is important that's now indisputable we're past that discussion we need to have other discussions and what's important is that that human influence is at a rate we haven't seen in the last 2000 years and what's important there is that the modeling of the future climate change it matches the observed change that we see so our modeling of of, of the increase in greenhouse gases is matching what we're seeing we're getting pretty good at predicting this for me, the anomalies in the climate, the kind of crazy climate events that we're seeing, isn't as worrying as the fact that having done this for 20 years, we used to have maps like this that showed um, the anomalies over the course of a decade. Then we'd have like an annual one that showed you the anomalies over the course of a year. And now um, NASA NOAA is producing one of these every month with significant numbers of events. And you'll have seen that in the media. You'll have seen that in your own lived experience. And that evolution of the maps tells us a lot, I think, about uh, the evolution of the climate crisis. Also, I want to stress, and this is a, important from a science perspective in particular, that we look at, we think about the natural and the human system dimensions. It's very easy to get caught thinking about just changes in nature because science often, you know, likes to focus on the natural systems, and then the social scientists like to focus on human. Linking the two is absolutely vital. You need to know some lingo on, on climate change. And there are three key responses if you're not familiar with this. Mitigation, which is limiting greenhouse gas emissions and, and improving the sinks to absorb um, greenhouse gases. Adapting, adaptation to impacts. And then where adaptation isn't sufficient, we're now starting to deal with losses, losses and damages. 
there has been a lot of progress with, with mitigation greenhouse gas emissions. We shouldn't all be doom and gloom, but there's a long way to go. We can see the impact of the Paris Agreement, the stated policies at least of governments on the, on the emissions trajectory, and the Glasgow pledges have further bent that curve uh, downwards, but there's still a huge way to go and a gap to reach net zero. The impacts around the world are differentiated. We see in terms of the impact vulnerability indices, you can see on this map, but so is the responsibility. This is why it's a climate justice issue, fundamental. Equally, the capacity to respond varies around the world, as touched on by Adam in the introduction, and that is central to the way SOAS uh, thinks about these, these issues. And don't forget that it's not just geography that matters, it's poverty and wealth fundamentally. And if we think of rich people in the world as causing most of the problem, this is the famous martini glass from, you know, the richest 10% are responsible for 49% of lifestyle emission, consumption emissions. We looked at some of these uh, inequities as well in academia recently. So the, the, the Reuters hot list of thousand academics shows on the top there, the global population and the difference on the Reuters hot list of the, of the top academics overwhelmingly skewed towards Europe and North America. If we do the same and look at these, the distribution of IPCC authors in the, last, in, in the current reports, um, we see a similar, there's a much more balanced IPCC authorship, but the hot list again, you know, shows Africa with very few African authors, very few women authors, um, and we've, we've written that about this extensively. Just as an example of um, some of the uh, the work that SARS is doing to, to examine these structural inequalities. And the work we do do, it covers all, all remits and many, many disciplines, as you will, as you'll hear from disciplinary perspectives in the forthcoming uh, Petra Kucha talks. So think, embed that in, in the way you think about what needs to be done, and particularly this debate between what needs to be done personally what actions you're taking in your own lifestyle versus the attempts to change uh, the system. They are not mutually incompatible. We can campaign for one and the other. Uh, we need both system changes and individual behavioral changes. They go together. So in terms of what SOAS is doing, we kind of um, we em embed everything we do in promoting climate justice through activism and outreach of our work. We want to develop that evidence base. It, interdisciplinarity is really crucial to us and our global partnerships, trying to bring those perspectives in from uh, elsewhere in the world, as you're here tomorrow. And we bring, want to bring that into our teaching in, in terms of decolonizing knowledge and our curricula, but also integrating sustainability uh, across our teaching program. But at the same time, yes, thinking about our own footprint and, and how to reduce that and increasingly how to adapt to some of the, particularly the extreme events that we're facing. Um, I also wanna say, let's stay positive. It's very easy to get doom and gloomy. Huge changes are happening around the world. Look at the, the way that the, the, the Indian government responded to um, Cyclone Yas, not with three A's, uh, in, in Odisha during a COVID pandemic. Incredible, the amount of uh, lives and, 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 and assets saved and the huge growth in so, solar globally as examples. So today's events, we're going to touch a little bit on the practicalities of COP, on international policy, on those kind of big global transitions, on the financial changes needed, different disciplines, and some of those different perspectives uh, about which we'll hear a lot more tomorrow. And that's my time up. So we will um, pass on next to Harold Haybaum, who is uh, work works in the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy and it, within the Department of Politics and International Studies. He's gonna give us a lowdown on the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on its structure and its evolution. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tom. Um, yeah, I'm forced for me to talk about the slightly drier history of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the process, its evolution, uh, and its outcomes. Um, but please do bear with me. The basic basis for, for these negotiations, of course, is scientific cooperation, scientific findings on the reality of man-made anthropogenic uh, climate change, the man-made greenhouse effect, which 
the scientific cooperation underpins the diplomatic uh, negotiations and engagement we've seen over the last uh, many years. So in many ways, climate change is an older scientific problem. We've gathered evidence for its existence for quite some time now, reaching back into the late 19th century, but more systematically since the 50s and 60s. And the creation of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change precedes the creation of the UNF. C. It's publishing its first assessment report in 1990. That's two years before the UNFCCC is created. So from this flow, two assumptions. Can we, because we agree that climate change is reality, anthropogenic climate change, can we have a shared understanding of the problem? And can we actually do something about it? Can we reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Well, that's proved difficult because the complex and highly politicized nature uh, of this process. Um, that is not so much in view in 1992 yet when countries gather for the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, the so-called Rio Earth Summit, and they stand together and saying, we need to do something about climate change. Here's President George Bush Sr. in his address to delegates. Very much an understanding that this should be a shared undertaking. Um, one of the results, one of the outcomes of this Rio Earth Summit is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It comes into effect two years later after enough countries ratified it. And that begins this multi-year negotiation process. That's where the conferences of the parties, the COPs, come from. So we're now in the 26th COP to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, what does the UNFCCC say? It says the overall goal is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere in a level that prevents dangerous uh, impacts. And they can do it in a timely fashion. Well, we don't really agree on what dangerous and timely fashion means at this point yet. Um, a second uh, key point of this uh, framework convention is that uh, it should be done in an equitable way. So countries that are historically more responsible for the problem should take action first. It's common, but it's differentiated in the way we address it. And countries that are wealthier and have the capabilities should act first and not those that are poorer and less able to do so. So this takes us to Article 4. Uh, wealthy countries should assist those poorer countries, uh, developing countries in the global south, in uh, addressing the impacts of climate change too. So all the key things that we're discussing still today are already contained within this framework convention on climate change in those early years. And money is often a sticking point. In record time, we move on to the first treaty under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, just three years after UNFCCC comes into effect. The Kyoto Protocol is negotiated. The United States takes a leading role here, Vice President Al Gore in Japan for the negotiations. But of course, the United States later backs, backs out of this process and doesn't want any part of it for the Kyoto Protocol. So what does it say? The Kyoto Protocol gives us an actual target. Let's reduce emissions by at least 5% below 1990 levels within the commitment period 2008 to 2012. The Framework Convention doesn't yet say that in terms of the target, Kyoto does. Uh, this global target breaks down into targets for individual countries, the Europeans, Canada, the United States, Japan, but not China, India, South Africa, and Brazil. And therein lies a big challenge for these negotiations and for countries to come together around the same table, the United States says, well, if China and India don't get targets, why should we do anything? It puts us at a competitive disadvantage. So we see regime failure for the Kyoto Protocol. Even though it comes into effect in 2005, we're not managing to realize those targets. Look at the compliance period 2008-12. We don't reduce emissions uh, nearly enough. The United States withdraws from the process. And emerging economies are not really integrated because of common but differentiated responsibilities. We move on in this process. We try to do more, we try to do better, but instead we get chaos. Chaos with negotiations in Copenhagen in 2009, this make or break point, Copenhagen turns into a disaster. Countries can't agree, can't come together and the rift between developing and developed countries really emerges in a much bigger way. We move on and fast forward a few more years, and all of a sudden we have success in Paris in 2015. This is because we change our approach to the negotiations, and we change the kind of goals and outcomes that we want to achieve uh, and that we think are important. So not a top-down agreement, uh, the likes of the Kyoto Protocol that set targets for individual countries, but a bottom-up approach that lets countries uh, 
put forward voluntary uh, solutions uh, um, without uh, without so much direction. So the approach here in negotiations is different too. Bring everyone together instead of pitting parties against each other. Have the heads of state and government negotiate first, and then take it into the more uh, functional level. So a bottom-up agreement in nature, rather than a more top-down approach that the Kyoto Protocol took, which was politically impossible at this point. There's only a very limited number of legally binding commitments, the most important ones, two-degree target that countries have agreed to. But achieving that depends on a bottom-up approach with those so-called nationally determined contributions in which countries can put forward anything that they believe is important in contributing to achieving the goals of the convention. Um, and so we've seen that the NDCs have looked rather different from country to country. Some have been more ambitious, some have been less ambitious. Uh, the road ahead, this is of course pre-COVID times. We see that this process continues. It's been going on for quite some time. We continue to have conference of the parties, we continue to have negotiations. We were supposed to have COP26 last year already, that's now out the window, but there are a number of different and important markers along the way. A global stock take of where we are in emissions, trying to achieve the outcomes of the Paris Agreement. So what have countries done? Countries have put forward plans to try and make Paris a reality uh, and, and be in accordance with a sort of net zero target by the middle of the century. Net zero, by the way, is not included in the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, but it follows from our goal of wanting to reduce emissions in a way that keeps us within two degrees that we have to achieve net zero by the middle of the century. So it's where we are now in terms of our negotiations process. And I leave the, the next more interesting bits to uh, the following speakers. Many thanks, Harold. So that provides a little uh, a backgrounder to uh, the evolution of the COP process. I, as Harold says, I get the, the joy of the, the fun bit of saying how COP actually works. Um, it's based in no large part on my pre-academic life. I started life as a uh, climate negotiator. As you can see, it was very stressful and it made me lose a lot of hair. Um, but that was uh, for the UK, de UK delegation as part of the EU, and then later um, working advising Bangladesh government as well. Um, so that was my original grounding. Um, it's important to acknowledge just how political the process is. It involves diplomacy. There's crazy um, position, far out positions in order to reach something in the middle. And politicians may have a longer timeline and uh, despite the COVID breakthroughs may not be following the science. For those of you who don't know where Scotland is, um, Glasgow is the, the, the first UK host of uh, climate change negotiations, and it's in the it'll be held in the, the event campus, which is a, a, and other buildings, lots more pavilions being uh, put up as we speak uh, around and about uh, Glasgow. The, the COP has a ridiculously complicated architecture. This just gives a, a taster of that, and I will break it down to something uh, more simple. But getting your head around. Uh, the different, all the different bodies and um, committees that run under the conference of the parties is, is difficult. It's a difficult job. Importantly, there are three apex bodies. So the conference of the parties essentially is the foot, is the overarching body, and it exists both for the convention itself and for any treaties underneath, including the Paris Agreement. So those who haven't signed the Paris Agreement but are still members of the UN Framework Convention will be in, in, in different parts of that system. Under the Conference of the Parties sit subsidiary bodies, the two main subsidiary bodies, basically one that's advisory on science. So that's where you'll get all the technical geeks who, who like talking about inventories of emissions and the subsidiary body on implementation, which is where the decisions are made for actually taking action. Whoops. Um, when you're at COP, you're looking for the agenda the document that sets out the individual agenda items, uh, quite technical, quite legal jargon, um, and you follow those through the formal contact groups, but also informal con consultations. So there may be, on any given day, you'd look for the rooms where there are, there are uh, contact groups that are formal ones, the informal ones you can't tend to go into unless you are a government delegation badge, badge holder, but you can see how those are, uh, those are emerging, and you're looking for where those groups are and following 
but generally best to follow one particular uh, agenda th through through the process rather than just getting overwhelmed with everything. There are formal discussions held in normally little rooms like this, depending on the the, the importance of the uh, of the agenda item. But there's numerous huddles as well. So these informal meetings tend to get into these smaller groups and particularly the different negotiating groups. Uh, so you have uh, regional blocks, you have small islands negotiating together, uh, least developed countries and the bigger blocks uh, around the, um, the European Union, for example, and the, uh, the G77, which is very, you know, most of the rest of the world, uh, not in the OECD. There's a high level section to finalize agreements. And normally that comes in the second week towards the end to sign off on the things that are gonna be gaveled through on the, on the plenary. But in this year, that's happening at the beginning. I don't quite know why. Um, the idea is to get some formal declarations and get everyone signed up early so you build momentum for then the discussions that happen in, in the subsequent week and a half. Um, you'll see this, you know, again, the picture from Copenhagen. This, these often go into the night and go into smaller groups Let's see uh, if that happens uh, here in, uh, in Glasgow. And then everyone meets in a final um, to create the decisions. There's often a lot of tension. It often goes into the night uh, to actually agree these and people putting forward their own perspectives um, or, or complaints. And it's a consensus-based body. So importantly, the smallest country can, can actually have its say. But the other side of uh, the COP is a whole host uh, of side events, some more fun than others, um, around massive variety of topics. So some are organized by the UNFCCC, some are organized um, in, in what's called the Green Zone by a variety of other uh, NGOs. And the other side, of course, is, the, is lobbying. So there's constant activity to dis discussions with the, uh, the government groups who are doing the negotiations. Um, access to that to that and building that is really a matter of working before the COP, to be quite frank, and to create those relationships before COPs happen and push agendas because things are very busy, uh, not least because the whole place is full of activists um, also pushing their agendas, both inside the COP building and outside on the streets with the huge marches that we've seen, particularly in recent times. This one is Copenhagen. So we're interested, I guess, from a size perspective in particular of who has a voice in these negotiations. Um, and there are constituencies for businesses, for um, non-party, non-government stakeholders and the multilateral system. Um, but at the end of the day, most of the input needs to come before the COP actually happens. The delegations themselves have structural inequalities because of the sizes and capacities of different delegations from around the world. Some invest more than others, some are able to invest more than others. We looked in particular at uh, those that aren't able to stay late, for example. And so the structural inequality of missing those late night when it runs on an extra day, people have had to go home. And there's increasing attention to gender balance, at least within the uh, delegations themselves. And that has been improving and there's a big, there's a major process within the UNFCCC to improve gender balance and, and the way that gender is uh, taken, accounted for across its decision-making bodies. So finally, um, there will be uh, blogs on the SOAS website. That the, uh, there'll be obviously a chance to engage on there. We'll be doing video logs from those who, of us who are at in COP in Glasgow, we'll, we'll make sure that this group has sent out the link and do follow us on Twitter. I haven't got everyone's Twitter handles, just selfishly my own, but also the SOAS, uh, the SOAS research um, Twitter handle there. So do follow for more um, SOAS related reporting from COP itself next week. And with that, I will hand over to Felicia Jackson, who is a uh, teaching fellow with us and an, an associate on our research. Um, who's going to talk you through a little bit about what some of the key issues are at COP26. She's particularly uh, an expert in finance and in, in data around finance, but she's going to talk more generally about the uh, what's at stake. Great. Please. Can I just confirm everyone can see? Yeah. Excellent. Great. She's just checking. So the thing about COP, Tom mentioned that um, I'm interested in finance and actually finance is one of the really, really big issues that has got to be resolved this year. The problem we've got is that we missed last year. 
Um, we are a long, long way away from where we need to be in terms of actually addressing climate change, especially if we're going to actually try to reach the 1.5 degree of warming, which is the goal of the Paris Agreement. I mean, we passed one degree, I think, in 2030. But if you think about the context, we're actually talking about the fact that despite COVID, we only managed to cut emissions by 6.4% last year. We need to do a number of things. We need to increase the ambition. We need to finalize the Paris rule book, which is basically all the details of how we're going to implement the carbon market, how we're going to basically how the Paris Agreement should work. That's despite the fact that it's already been in place for five years, which means we're also now talking about aligning timetables, because that's one of the really big areas of disagreement. And that's timetables on NDCs. So we need to see ambition. We need to know what's going to happen. We need to actually move things forward from just commitments, but to actually find ways of proving accountability and seeing actions put into place. So the main issues we've got to get through are these, obviously. Um, the difficult question of finance is really hugely about the enhanced transparency framework, which we actually have to get through, and adaptation and loss and damage. So all of these issues here are significant for COP26, but they're also very closely interconnected. I think this is a really interesting image uh, table just because it talks very clearly about which NDCs are in line with the 1.5 degree goal. And we have one country where that's the case. And I think given the fact that, you know, we know that emissions are cumulative, we know that we've actually passed one degree of warming. We know that we're running out of time in terms of taking action. So we know that we need new NDCs, we know we need new ambition, we also know that we need collaboration, and that's between business and stakeholders and activists and countries. We've got some issues, you know, G's not coming, uh, Biden's having problems with his climate strategy. The reality is we run the risk of there being not enough agreed. Now, this is the figure for the amount of finance that's been mobilized for uh, from developed to developing countries. It looked like there was about 20 billion missing for the 2020 figures, um, which is a critical issue for trust between the parties. That is the funding that is intended and agreed to go from developed to developing world. One of the challenges, of course, the terminology, it's never been exactly clear whether that's public or private. We need to actually work out what the long-term financing framework's going to be, what's going to happen post-2025. We've got commitments for different types of finance, but you know, it's nowhere near where it needs to be. And now part of the problem is this lack of transparency, this lack of accounting rules, and the fact that we need to go beyond just greenhouse gases. Because Tom mentioned this, the relationship, and Adam indeed as well, this relationship between the environment, between nature and the social issues, we have to start measuring things in different ways. We've got the transition that's beginning to happen, but the real danger at COP26 is if we don't get strong agreements, what we're losing is the driver for private sector action, which has been fear of transition risk. And that is investors and companies getting exercised about the fact that there could be a price on carbon, that they need to, you know, that they will suffer from policy and regulation. Um, capacity building was mentioned as well. This is hugely important and has been a huge problem throughout the history of, of the climate negotiations and climate action. Um, in terms of capacity and technology transfer, we've got work being done on gender equality, but we really need to move much harder and much faster. Article 6 is a key element of um, the agreement that's got to be reached, because basically this was another one that was pushed back from Madrid because nobody would agree. This is supposed to enable voluntary international cooperation on climate action through the use of trading emissions reductions. The problem we've had, and we've had the same problem since 2018, is what text is going to be agreed regarding offsets. So how do we go about avoiding double counting? Whether or not countries are gonna be able to use previous Kyoto emissions credits. Um, there were talks earlier this year and they actually failed to move things forward. Everyone agrees that we need substantive decisions on Article 6 this year, but no one can actually agree on what they're going to be. 
So adaptation is again another incredibly important issue. I'm sorry to say this, but they're all really important issues and everyone gets very exercised about them. The thing about adaptation is it's critical for a number of different reasons. It's not just because it's related to resilience, because it is related to nature. It's also that there hasn't been sufficient finance devoted to it. I think it's roughly 20% of the overall climate finance so far. Um, what it needs to do, it connects to the ways in which nature can help protect countries from extreme weather events, from droughts and fires and floods and the different ways it goes through. But it also gives us an opportunity to start thinking about valuation, how we actually put a value on ecosystem services and nature. Because what we're seeing is this link between disaster risk management, the undervaluation of environmental cost and benefit, and growth in GHGs, and that's what's got to be actually addressed. Loss of damage is something that's pulled out of the adaptation discussion, so it was actually in the second priority of the previous list. This is the idea that those affected, and this was agreed in Warsaw, that those affected by climate change have the right to compensation for climate impacts. Once adaptation is done and limits are reached and irreversible loss and damage occurs, then the money those who are suffering from those impacts should be paid. It's this idea of a climate debt. Um, the idea that wealthy countries and companies should be held accountable. Now we saw in Madrid the agreement on the Santiago network to connect vulnerable developing countries with technical assistance, resources, knowledge, etc. But it's still really contentious around the liability and language because while there is discussion of the fact that those affected have the right to compensation, there aren't many countries that want to actually sign up to something that may lead to li legal liability in the future. I'm not going to talk in any detail about sectoral approaches because I've whizzed through the entire lot. Um, but I think what's important about this is we actually do have the technology, we have the processes, we have the regulations, and we have an understanding of what needs to be done. This is a political and diplomatic problem, and that's why COP26 is so important. Thank you very much, Felicia. So um, before we get into some of the issue areas, I thought we'd do a, a quick poll. Um, if I just share my screen and ask you to, um, if you look in the chat box now, you'll see the Menti, the, the link to this Menti poll. Click on that and you can choose uh, how pessimistic or optimistic you are that global greenhouse emissions will start to go down. Um, when do you think this might happen? It's quite fun watching the uh, the poll votes come in and the uh, numbers bounce accordingly. So we've seen a lot of uh, the use of the term net zero <coughs> um, has become the fashionable thing to say. This is basically getting minimizing your emissions as much as possible and then uh reducing those that you can't stop emitting by committing to um reductions through global through, uh, greenhouse gas sinks like forests and possibly other uh, more engineering and technology based approaches so that looks pretty stable now thanks everyone for voting um just to make everyone feel a little bit more positive about the global climate change processes and where we are, global greenhouse emissions have already started going down. So whilst we talk about 2030 and 2050 targets for net zero, emissions reductions global, globally are, are reducing. They have started to go down. And for all the talk of the, the, the COVID rebounds, and the, the fact that the um, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere are still creeping up, you know, on the 400 uh, parts a million mark. Um, the emissions reductions that, that, that are in, pro, in progress, we're, we're making great strides. So I hope that makes everyone feel somewhat more uh, optimistic about, uh, about our, uh, where we're going and uh, our ways forward. 
So now we'll get on to some of those different technical areas um, that uh, Felicia has just outlined for you. And first of all, um, Christine Orton from our School of Finance and Management will talk about mitigation of greenhouse gases and um, the net, net uh, low to net zero uh, carbon uh, strategies, particularly focusing on low and middle income country contexts. So feel free to share your screen, Christine. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, so my talk's about innovation for low and zero net carbon, focusing in particular on low and middle income countries. I'm going to talk about targets and instruments, progress to target to date, the use of non-market regulatory instruments and the implications of that for COP and, uh, and beyond. Um, so the targets in the Paris Agreements that we've seen are set in terms of global temperature targets. And so they're not under the control of any individual country. They're under the control of us all collectively. And there's another target there, which is that developed economies for climate justice have to deliver 100 billion pounds per annum of finance to developing econ economies from 2025 to 2020 to 2025. Um, what are the instruments? The instruments are the nationally determined contributions. Each country has to say how much it's gonna to contribute to limiting, um, reducing greenhouse gases. There's also the finance instrument, which is based on climate justice and the polluter pays principle. Um, and that is important in order to allow GDP to rise in low and middle income countries and preserve, reduce inequality and poverty. There's also two articles that have not really been used, article 6.8 and 6.9, that focus on non-market instruments. So what's our progress to date on these targets? Well, we've missed them. In terms of, if you look at the latest analysis of the nationally determined contributions, we're going to miss the targets um, that have been that have been set um, in terms of temperature. We also miss, as, um, as we've just seen, the finance target as well. We're about 20 billion short. And I would just say that most of this finance is in the form of loans, and and Oxfam have estimated that 40% of these loans are at non-concessional rates, that are market rates or above. And then on Article Six, particularly these two articles, Paragraph 6.8 and 6.9, there's been virtually no progress. Um, and my view is that the 1.5 you know, preferred target is unlikely to be met without regulatory spur to innovation and technological diffusion via emission standards. So these articles, 6.8, 6.9, there's probably gonna be a lot of talk about them at COP, they need wings, they need to start being utilized in a way that they haven't been uh, utilized to date. Um, if we, Think about the value of these instruments. It goes back to the tragedy of the commons. You know, if we all behave individually, we're not going to get anywhere. We need collective solutions. And anyone that uh, there's a nice picture there from my holiday in Scotland this year, in the Durinish common pasture lands, where those cattle were on that land for four hours. So it is possible to come to these agreements. There's another instrument that we can use, um, which is the Porter hypothesis. And Porter argued that properly constructed regulatory standards encourage companies to re-engineer their technology and result in progress. And that these strict regulations um, prod companies into innovating and to produce better products. Now, can we do this? Well, there is an example from the Montreal Protocol. Um, it's a long way away in terms of language from the Paris Agreement, but I think we need to uh, try and find a common language between these two these two UN um, instruments. The Montreal Protocol set binding targets to cut CFC gases by 50% um, in 10 years. In actual fact, we achieved this in three years, despite the fact that companies like DuPont said this was impossible, um, it would never be done, it would take two decades to get new products. The developing economies were given longer to adjust, that's the blue line, um, but we achieved it. What about greenhouse gas emissions? Can we do the same? We do have cleaner transport technologies. And the question is, why aren't they diffused more quickly? One reason is that we don't have what we had in Montreal. We don't have a, a binding target and commitment to restrict them. So we need to combine these market and non-market instruments. And you know, just to illustrate that point, there's a, a chapter I wrote in this book, Innovation for Long, Low Carbon Economy. 
on can the car maker save the planet? And we just came to the conclusion, not by themselves, they would need some form of binding regulation to diffuse hybrid technology. And in a later book, when we um, launched it, Sir David King just said, it's not science, it's social science. You social scientists, you've got to diffuse these technologies. So what's happened with hybrid electric vehicles? This is the situation in the US. The market share is combined of all of those three types of vehicles is 7.6% is now. It's taken us 20 years to get there. Um, California's done much better because it's got much tougher regulations. China has done quite well, but China's share of electric vehicles is still below 5%. And in most developing countries, it's below 1%. And if we look at the country that's done best, it's Norway, because Norway has used a whole range of instruments, but in 2017, it set a target um, to get to, for electric vehicles that has acted as that spur to innovation. And I just wonder, is it significant that Norway also did that at a time when they had a woman prime minister? And just to build on something that Tom was saying about the role of gender, do women make a difference in these negotiations? The nice paper been published in Environmental Politics that said that male and female legislators expressed the same concern, but women were much more likely to legislate. And progress has been made on that in terms of getting more women into the meetings, but the speaking time for men and women, their contributions is still very unequal. So that's something that we would need to bear in mind and try and address in future. And of course, one woman who has written extensively on the need for collective action and rules and governing the commons, common for resources like the atmosphere, is uh, Eleanor Ostrom. And there's a lot in her work that I think we could learn from. So where does this leave us um, in terms of policy? Um, Non-market instruments and standards can catalyze innovation. But there is a regional innovation paradox, which is that low-income regions that need to innovate more to catch up actually find it harder to do so even when the money is offered as public subsidies. So we need regional innovation strategies. That's where rich countries and low-income countries have worked together in order to encourage that locally developed innovation in low-income regions. So I've come to the end of my time. Thank you for listening. Many thanks, Christine. That's uh, really, really insightful. And thank you also for keeping the time. Um, it's Fantastic, everyone's uh, keeping us keeping us on schedule. So, retaining the, the theme around mitigation, uh, we will move to Giuseppina Siciliano, who is uh, a lecturer in the Centre for Environment Development, and Environment and Policy in the Department of Development Studies, um, and her research focuses on how some of these transitions that Christine's talked about, touched on um, in the energy sector in particular, um, need to interrelate to social justice issues. Juicy, go ahead and share. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I'm sharing the presentation. Can you see it? We can, but it's not on slideshow yet. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Thanks. Takes a little bit of time. Sorry. <laughs> Is uploading. Can you see it now? We can see the uh, can see the PowerPoint, but it hasn't gone to slideshow format just yet. Yeah. Okay. So you should see. It hey, now, right? you're in. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> So good morning, everyone. As Tom said, I'm a lecturer in sustainable development at the Center for Development, Environment and Policy. And today I'm going to talk about just transitions and in particular, just energy transitions with a specific focus on renewable energy infrastructures. I will start my presentation with uh, providing with different definitions of energy transition from different perspectives. The just transition concept was introduced by the International Labour Organization in 2015, and this, the definition makes a clear reference to three pillars of sustainable development, but, but also issues of inclus inclusiveness and participation, eradication of poverty, and the importance of ensuring decent works for all. The need for a green, sustainable, and socially inclusive transition is also mentioned in international climate, uh, climate policies and strategies. Uh, such as the Paris Agreement, for example, uh, the Agenda for Sustainable Development, the EU Green New Deal, and it also represents one of the main goals 
of COP26, which is to ensure ju a just transition towards a climate neutral society. In this context, environmental and climate justice movements introduced for the first time in a community perspective of the energy decision-making process. In the view, just transition needs to be democratic and give decision-making powers to those most affected by the negative effects of, uh, of the transitions, uh, which calls for a complete shift from an extractive economy based on capital accumulation, natural resources, uh, exploitation, top-down decision, decision to a regenerative economy uh, in which deep democracy, cooperation, social cohesion, and regeneration are the basis of the transition. But what is the commitment for the transition? We have, we have heard from previous presentations that the main commitment is to keep 1.5 degrees within, within reach. And uh, this can be achieved uh, reducing global carbon emissions to net zero by 2050, which requires actually a complete transformation of the energy sector. In fact, as we will see in the next slide, uh, the energy sector is the source of more than 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions. As we can see here, 70 in 2019, 73.2% of global greenhouse gas emissions comes from different energy sectors. Uh, so it, this is a, a very, to change the energy sector is, is a very, it is challenging. Also because as, as you can see from this graph, 84.3% of global energy comes from fossil fuels at the moment. Only 15.7% from renewable comes, it comes from low carbon sources of which 11.4% from renewables. These are data um, referred to 2019. However, the good news is that it's that actually um, the year-to-year -year percentage change in primary energy consumption, see an increase in solar, in solar energy consumption, wind, and other renewables, but also as an increase in, in gas and oil, uh, gas and oil consumption, which is um, gas and oil consumption, but less than, than renewables. So according to the dominant energy transition narrative, actions to achieve net zero requires the development of large scale infrastructure, a centralized energy production, as well as top down decision and its decision based on increased efficiency, technological changes and cheap, cheaper technology, which is a technocratic approach to the, to the transition. And the energy trans infrastructures play a key role in this narrative. Um, um, investment in clean energy and the energy infrastructure has to more than triple, triple by 2030, and hydropower, wind, and solar energy need to increase the gigawatts addition tremendously. This requires a lot of cooperation and strong, strong collaborations at the, at the global level between nations, north-south cooperation, south-south cooperations for the next five, ten years. For the development of large infrastructures, upgrade of infrastructure, modernization, and expansion. However, it's also important to say that opposition to the construction of the renewable energy infrastructures, for, for example, and energy projects, are also increasing all over the world. Recently, 150 NGOs have, has, have signed a manifesto to stop the construction of new other power plants in Europe. And local communities call for community decision powers when it comes to energy transitions, in contrast to the dominant te technocratic approach. Moreover, in response to the technocratic approach to energy transition, energy justice, justice movement emerged in 2010, which is closely related to environmental and, and climate justice. The main goals are achieving energy sovereignty, ensure access to economic benefits of energy decision, and access to clean and affordable energy for all. From an, from an academic point of view, justice is framed based on the classical two tenets of justice, which are distributional justice, procedural justice, and cognition justice. But it's also important to take into consideration restorative justice, which means to provide quality assessment of the impacts of energy transitions and mitigation strategies. Um, according to the a research I've carried out in the Global South on the renewable energy infrastructures, the negative impacts on local communities, I've, I've found that the negative impacts on, on local communities are, are also exacerbated by unequal power relations, differences in energy affordability, and experiences of distribution and inequality within different geographical areas, such as rural and urban areas. 
therefore, therefore, I think that an holistic framework is required, which includes a consideration of power relations. Um, this requires the combination of a hardware and financial framing with justice concerns of fair distribution, inclusiveness, and the consideration of differentiated needs and priorities in society. In conclusion, just transitions should be analyzed as a high political decision and not only uh, using a te technocratic approach, which is the one that's used by globally at the moment, mainly. And the adoption of an energy justice approach can ensure fair energy access and distribution, high quality assessments, and often provide, provide more sustainable solutions. Therefore, to achieve just transitions, COP26 should champion equity center energy decisions in international negotiations, also give greater consideration to community-based renewable energy solutions in international debates. Um, that's the end of my presentation, thank you. You can find my publications if you're interested in uh, my research in my SARS staff profile in the Google Scholar field. Thank you. Thanks very much, Susie, fantastic. Um, you know, I'm sure that many people uh, who are in the audience now um, will have strong interest in climate justice and particularly justice around energy transitions. I find it fascinating that just the just transition approach has been taken up on by politicians who recognize, you know, this is a major block to some creating some of these changes. We're seeing it currently in the USA, obviously, with uh, Democrats from, from coal mining regions uh, seeking to block uh, the, the package of measures there. It's, you know, it's, it's more than just a, a casual concern. Thanks very much, Juicy. So let's move from mitigation concerns to adaptation concerns. We're lucky to have uh, Andy Newsham in the Department of Development Studies, who's uh, been an adaptation expert for, for many years. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about what some of those adaptation um, issues are within COP26, expanding a little bit on that excellent um, introduction from uh, Felicia. So Andy, the floor is yours. We can't hear you though, so you might be Sorry, can you see my first slide? Sorry about that. Can you see the slide? We can, all good, thank you. Awesome, okay, right. So we're gonna be talking about climate change at COP26 in the context of um, the global adaptation goal, loss, uh, damage, and uh, responsibility. Um, is this gonna change by itself then, the slide? If it's, if it's set the tra you've set the transitions, then yes. But uh, you're welcome to use your... Uh... Back, back and forth of it if, if it's not. Right, okay, I'm not sure it is, but I'll try and keep to 20 seconds uh, per slide. Okay, Perfect. so um, the global goal uh, on adaptation was something that was agreed as part of, uh, of COP21 um, uh, back in 2015, part of the Paris Agreement. And it was about ensuring an adaptation, an adequate adaptation response in the context of the goal of holding average global warming well below two degrees C and pursuing efforts to hold it below 1.5 degrees C. And what in effect the global goal on adaptation requires us to do is to enhance adaptive capacity and resilience um, and to reduce vulnerability with a view to contributing to sustainable uh, development. So that's, uh, the, the, in the broadest possible terms, what this COP26 is trying to do on adaptation. So um, it's, as I say, about protecting and restoring ecosystems, about building defenses, uh, warning um, systems, and resilient infrastructure and agriculture to avoid loss uh, and of homes, livelihoods, and, and even uh, lives, of course. That's the, the overall kind of um, steer that we're getting from this particular COP26. So there's a question about how we're, how we're doing that. So one part is about the finance, which we've heard about, um, and I don't want to say too much about this ahead of what Uli is going to tell us later. But the idea is to you know mobilize at least a hundred billion dollars uh, uh, a year. You know, by, ideally by last year. We're not quite doing that just yet. But to put this in context, um, G20, G20 countries provided more than two point four trillion. US dollars in subsidies for fossil fuels between 2015 and uh, 2019. So there's something about kind of not just looking at the gap in adapt uh, adaptation and uh, funding itself and, and, and fi finance for it, but also looking at where the money and what it's being spent on instead. And it's this kind of 
missing of targets and focusing our energies elsewhere, which has led to the idea of this thing called uh, loss and damage. Um, this is the idea that adaptation and mitigation are not going to be uh, enough um, to, to, to prevent uh, negative impacts from climate change. Loss and damage is inevitable and that we need some kind of international um, response to this via, you know, there's now the, the, the international Warsaw mechanism that we've, that, that's, that's been established, um, but that we need to do something about the fact that there will actually be uh, damage. And what does that what does that look like in, in general terms? Well, it's about deteriorating livelihoods and loss of territory or extreme floods, um, leading to loss of lives and property, heat waves, sea level rise. A lot of the kinds of things that we've, we've, we've heard quite a lot of, uh, about um, you know, in, uh, over the years. And I want to flesh it out by giving us a more specific example of what loss, of, loss and damage looks like right now. If you look at the way the climate change has already changed in uh, so the climate has already changed in Namibia. It's already ranked as one of the top 20 countries in the world that's most affected by extreme weather. And regions have experienced between three to six bad uh, rainfall seasons from 2014 to 2019 alone. And this has a lot to do with the fact that the data the most recent data is suggesting there's been a structural break in the rainfall. That is to say um, that uh, there, there is on average less rainfall as a a pronounced drying trend since the 1980s. The rainy season has shortened by 30 days on average. That's a huge uh, thing to happen if, you, if you're a farmer. There's a decrease in the consecutive level of rainfall days. There's a, there's a more chance of there being up to 20 days in a row with no rainfall whatsoever, which at crucial parts in, in for example, harvesting, a, uh, growing a crop is, is is potentially going to, to damage the crop. And if you look at uh, something like tobacco production, um, which is something that has been seen as a, as a route out of poverty in, in, in Zimbabwe because it's a cash crop and lots of people uh, are going into it right now. Um, it's actually become harder to farm tobacco under uh, rain-fed production systems. This is partly because when you transfer the tobacco plants from the nursery into the ground uh, and you know from, away from the seedbeds, um, you need for there to be a sufficient amount of rain to come at the right time. And that is um, increasingly not happening. The erratic rainfall of, of, uh, of a rainfall reported across the uh, field sites of some research that myself and some Zimbabwean colleagues have been uh, doing, which has just come out and I haven't put a reference for it on this slide. I can share it later. Um, is basically leading to people to abandon tobacco production. Uh, it's a reduction also in the quality of the crop so that when you, if you are able to sell it, you're getting less for it. So I hope that really, you know, gives us a sort of a grounded context for some of these, these ideas because loss and damage is, is an issue that we, we have to deal with, but it's also tricky. Tricky because it's difficult to attribute anthropogenic climate change as a cause of specific extreme events and sometimes longer term trends. There's been some progress towards this, but it's still quite uh, difficult to do. And it has an implication for thinking through loss and damage, which is how do we know what loss and damage is attributable? How do we know how to calculate the levels of loss and damage uh, from particular places? And how are we going to target the money? There are different views on doing this. Uh, there's a north-centered view, uh, which is that it requires us to improve adaptation to reduce um, and humanitarian efforts to tackle losses. Um, and look at you know how particular mechanisms like you know insurance or social protection might be better employed. But there's a sudden uh, view, if you like, that because this is uh, you know beyond uh, what we you know what's been um, proposed in terms of adaptation and won't be dealt with by that, there needs to be extra money on top of that to, 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 to address this, some form of compensation, reparation even, to use a, a term that's used in some other debates. And I wanted to link this to the question of responsibility, because ultimately loss and damage is something that's of concern because some people are held historically responsible for it. And there are different ways of calculating this. And quite often we think of China as being the world's you know, biggest emitter, 
which it is. But if you look at it in terms of um, its share of the atmospheric uh, commons, if you like, about where its debate, where its contribution comes in relative to a, a much more historical understanding of, uh, you know, of, of emissions and also looking at consumption based data as much as possible, you get a much different uh, picture. You know, China is, is kind of is still up there, but it's, it's nothing uh, in relation to uh, what uh, European and uh, you know, North American countries historically have done. And of course, going back to this historical kind of, you know, uh, framing and, and taking it right back, the, the, the concern is always that, well, we didn't know that we were doing that. And according to some commentators, such as Jason Hickel, one way of thinking about this is, you know, that excusable ignorance is limited to the extent that carbon emissions are uh, but one manifestation of a process that has had a wide range of long known harms. And he termed this sort of atmospheric colonization, putting greenhouse gas emissions into the broader project of um, European imperial expansion and the globalization of trade relations that came through that over the last you know, uh, few centuries, basically. So if we start to think about responsibility like that, then um, loss uh, and damage uh, becomes legible perhaps in terms like reparations, which we have for other areas of, of, of historical injustice around slavery. So perhaps that's one uh, fruitful thing to think about in terms of, uh, of <laughs> how we sort out loss and damage uh, going forward. Uh, that's all from me, Tom. Fantastic, Andy, and uh, very, very clear slides. So uh, we'll, we'll forgive the, uh, the lack of auto progression. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So taking another, that, that that's kind of covers a lot of those adaptation and loss and damage issues and taking another major chunk of the issues um, that Faye presented and will be looming large at COP, as you've heard from Andy there at the end as well, is about uh, financing. And first of all, you know, how, how we finance climate change action full stop, but also the debates around that within COP itself. We're lucky to have um, a Centre for Sustainable Finance uh, um, full of amazing uh, academics and, and partners uh, within SOAS and two, two such people, uh, Yanis de Fermos and uh, Ulrich Volz will lead us off with their presentation and they're doing a double hander so even more congratulations and thanks to, to, to you guys for, for, for sharing uh, Pecha Kucha presentation which may be a, a global first. Over to you. Thank you Tom. So Yanis and I will talk about climate action, financing climate action and uh, so talk is cheap, we need to put our money uh, where our mouse is. And it's going far beyond the 100 billion that were uh, uh, mentioned before. So Article 21C of the Paris Agreement sets out the goal of making finance flows consistent with the pathway towards low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. And that has to be the goal. And for this to happen, we need two things to, to take place. First, we need to rapidly phase out financing uh, of actions that are undermining the climate and also other sustainability goals. And secondly, we need to massively ramp up investment in climate action. And that has to involve both adaptation and mitigation. For the time being, the finance sector is really being part of the problem. So you can see that actually global fossil fuel financing since the Paris Agreement has expanded. So we need to rapidly phase out this because this is destroying the planet, the climate. Um, but markets alone will not fix the problem. We need firm guidance from the authorities that govern the financial sector, central banks and supervisors to make sure that environmental risks are properly priced in and uh, accounted for. So, uh, but one big problem is that even if uh, uh, financial institutions start to price in climate risk and so on, who's going to pay the price? And the answer, unfortunately, is that the countries that are most vulnerable to climate change have to pay already now a climate risk premium. So in a report for uh, the UN, we showed that um, climate vulnerable countries have to pay a higher cost on their debt um, because of their climate vulnerability. We've controlled for all kinds of other macroeconomic uh, factors. 
And our estimates suggested that uh, for every $10 paid to interest by developing countries, they have to pay an additional dollar due to their climate vulnerability. And that is of course deeply unjust. Uh, and uh, Adam at the beginning highlighted the importance of, of climate justice. And, and um, so uh, developing countries are already pu uh, punished by being more climate vulnerable and the physical impacts, but also for a, by a higher cost of debt. And this extends both to governments and firms, and it undermines their capacity to invest in climate adaptation and resilience, uh, which is really holding back uh, their development prospects. And countries, climate vulnerable countries are facing a vicious circle where they already are very vulnerable. They're facing climate risk premiums in capital markets uh, and the higher cost of capital provide them less fiscal space to undertake the crucial investment in resilience. And the question is, can we set off a virtuous cycle where we increase investment in climate adaptation measures uh, that help to lower climate risk premiums lower cost of capital and provide more room for fiscal uh, resilience. And the answer is that uh, for, or the, the truth is for many vulnerable countries, they won't have enough fiscal space. So thank you, Uli. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say now how climate finance is defined within the UN uh, Framework Convention. And as it has already been highlighted, we have that climate finance refers both to mitigation and adaptation. And crucially, the convention recognizes that we have different responsibilities. So this is why we have seen all these discussions uh, in Kyoto, in, in Paris, about the need for developed countries to provide financial assistance to developing countries. And financial assistance can come from uh, different types of uh, sources, both public and private. Uh, now, if we look at the beneficiaries of climate finance so far, we will see that uh, we have that Asian countries have received a significant part of this uh, climate finance flows, uh, a bit less than 50%. And then we have that uh, about 25% uh, has gone to countries in Africa. And um, basically Latin America has received about 15%. Now the source of climate finance are basically four. We have this distinction between bilateral public finance, uh, multilateral public finance that has to do with finance that for instance comes from multilateral development banks and multilateral climate funds. Uh, we have finance provided by the export credit agencies. And crucially, we have private finance, which refers to finance that comes from private sources, but has been mobilized by public sources at the same time. And as it has already been highlighted, we have this target of uh, 100 billion US dollars per year. Uh, this was a target that was set in 2009. We haven't achieved this target so far, uh, but the expectation is that this will be achieved in 2020. And as, uh, uh, it, uh, as we can see in this graph, uh, the, the main source of finance is related with public. So most of finance so far has uh, come from uh, public sources, a bit much less from, from private sources. Now, if we look at the uh, instruments that have been used in the case of public finance, uh, as Christine pointed out before, most of it is in the, in the form of loans. Uh, we have less finance in the form of grants, and this is crucial because it means that when this finance is provided, uh, we have that the debt commitments of countries go up, and this can create financial fragility. And as it has already been, uh, uh, been pointed out, we uh, have that most of climate finance has concentrated on uh, mitigation. We have less, much less finance for, for adaptation, and one of the targets in the, in the, in, in the coming years is for this uh, to increase. So if we uh, think about what should be done right now, there is a lot of discussion about the need to increase the amount of climate finance. And I think this is necessary, but we also need to pay much more attention to the composition of, of climate finance. We need to increase grants and we need to increase uh, finance for adaptation. Now, there is also a discussion about the role of, of private finance. And as Uli pointed out before, it's very important to start reducing dirty finance. It's not enough to just increase green finance. And if uh, private finance plays now a more important role, we need to make sure that we regulate private finance because private finance might not always do what is necessary in order to achieve climate justice, for instance. And we don't have to forget about debt relief programs. We need to design ambitious debt relief programs in order to deal with issues of, of climate justice. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Janice and Oli as well. It's a, a very, very quick run through, but some uh, some really uh, central issues there. Do look, um, those who are listening and watching, do look up uh, the work of the Centre for Sustainable Finance in SOAS. Um, there's a lot of different research streams going on and uh, plenty of additional reading and, uh, and talks to see there. Um, we now start to get into some more sectoral and uh, and interdisciplinary issues. Um, one area in, within the COPs that's emerged, particularly with the change uh, towards the Paris Agreement of a more voluntary approach and recognising that governments aren't necessarily the ones who are going to do all the work or even best place to do all the work. The role of cities has really uh, come up the agenda and a lot of cities have really taken centre stage, even when their national governments aren't uh, taking uh, taking up the mantle. So uh, we're looking to have uh, Leo Horn Pathanatai from the World Resources Institute and, uh, and a professor of practice with us uh, at SOAS, um, who's going to speak to us about the role of cities within COP. Leo, feel free to share your screen. Thank you, Tom. Um, bear with me as I figure out how to do this. Um, Can you see my screen? Oh, no. Yeah, that's... so just need to put it on uh, presentation mode. Can, can you see my presentation? We can, we just need to put okay. it on presentation Great. mode and we're good. Fantastic. All right, um, is it clicking? One second, okay. So full disclosure, uh, I come to this topic with a giant bias. Um, I'm an urbanist, I'm very fond of cities, spent my whole life in uh, these six magnificent cities that you see displayed here. And I'm also a, um, an environmentalist and nature lover. And I feel very blessed to be in a position where I bring these two passions together. So the relationship between cities and our climate is storied, it's complicated, and it's inescapably linked. In the climate story, um, uh, cities are, are villains, they are victims, they're also heroes, and I would say that they're exactly the kind of heroes that we need. Cities epitomize the extractive and ecocidal tendencies of our industrial civilization, wedded to fossil fuels and divorced from nature. They are veritable externality machines, and indeed climate change is an externality of the economic growth that our cities have been driving. But I don't want to dwell too much on the toxic part of this relationship. Uh, it's plain to see that um, when you consider that cities that only account for 3% of the Earth's surface and how just over half of the world's population drive economic output and 70% uh, of economic output and about as much in terms of energy emissions, uh, sorry, uh, energy related emissions. So as cities go, so does the climate. And there's been a lot of uh, uh, commentary, commentary with the pandemic about urban regression. So I just wanted to put in perspective that this trend of urbanization is not abating. Um, the reality is that by mid-century, two thirds of the uh, global population will be living in cities representing an increment of about 2.5 billion people. And cities are also uh, climate victims. You know, they, uh, they're suffering from, from the effects of th this climate problem that they're creating. 70% of them are grappling with current, with effects currently and 90% of urban population is in coastal areas and low-lying delta regions directly vulnerable to climate. Uh, we're dealing with a real ticking time bomb. It's not just violent weather that we need to be worried about, it's access to food. Hundreds of millions of people live in cities that are uh, vulnerable to food shortages in the next um, uh, decade or so. So cities have a real stake in, in solving this problem. What gives me hope, though, is that this relationship is not a deterministic one. Uh, we got to where we are as a result of choices and paradigms of urban development that are changeable. And a different urban uh, future is not just possible, but needed. And indeed, we are seeing across the world growing examples of cities breaking that cycle. And I'll illustrate this point with reference to two cities I know very well. London, once uh, infamous for its smog, is now so green it's been designated as a national park and is leading the way in the fight against climate change, having successfully decoupled growth from emissions. Beijing, on the other hand, has gone from being a cycling haven 
heaven to a cloud city in, within my lifetime. So where are we today? Uh, the good news is cities are stepping up all over the world. Over 11,000 cities have made commitments to climate change, uh, to climate action, of which 1,000 have stepped up under the race to zero to uh, deliver act, uh, decarbonization in line with the Paris goals. Cities are also much more visibly at the table globally in international processes. Their crucial roles is recognized and enshrined in the goals and languages of the Paris Agreement, the SDGs, and of course the new urban agenda is very explicit about their role in addressing global challenges. And we are in a good position of knowing what is needed. The IPCC report, uh, special report on 1.5, revealed that all cities need to be carbon neutral by 2050. And um, thankfully, it also says, points out that cities uh, with their concentration of people, economic activity, and infrastructure are systems that can decarbonize and be made resilient fast enough. And actually, although it's a tall order, we've done the math, and um, there are actions that can deliver 90% of reductions in, in cities by 2050. And here's the best part, though. Doing this will generate tremendous benefits that not only far outweigh the costs in pure financial terms, but also result in, um, in economic savings, tremendous economic savings. I'll let you look at the numbers on the slide. And um, as well as creating jobs and economic opportunities for millions of people. So this is an opportunity agenda that we're looking at. Of course, cities already have their hands full um, dealing with uh, a lot of other problems. 70% uh, of city dwellers lack access to reliable core services like electricity, transport, housing, and almost a billion people live in informal settlements. So here's the trick. Climate action won't stand a chance if it's seen as just another competing demand on limited city resources. What we are talking about, and I think this should be clear by now, is nothing short of um, than a uh, transformation of cities uh, with climate action integrated as a cross-cutting concern and underlying driver of urban transformation. And by the way, we know what that looks like in practice um, and, and in very practical terms. Cities can be made compact, clean, and connected through investments in clean transport, in improved building efficiency, better waste management, uh, and all this yields tremendous economic opportunities and savings while bringing emissions way down. And the, uh, by making equity the entry point for, uh, for, for this transformation, everybody gains. In fact, Transforming cities by making them more equal is the single most effective tool that countries have at their disposal for transforming their economies, creating jobs and improving quality of life for their citizens. So in the last two slides, just very quickly on COP, I could do a whole pick of Pecha Kucha just on, on this, but these are the three must haves at COP. There's a little play of words here, the three must get here. Uh, ambition, resilience, finance, Cities are, are essential to deliver the uh, success across all of these um, uh, pillars. And finally, we, there's a lot of attention on Glasgow, but Glasgow is, uh, if successful, going to be just a kickoff for a decade of action. This is a decade where we need to see uh, urban transformation, and this will not just deliver us from the climate crisis, but will give us cities that work better for all. Thank you, Tom. Many thanks, Leo. That uh, gives us a very positive vision and uh, it leads us into more um, positive, affirmative action from um, our activist activities and particularly those within the student union. Um, and I give a chance for Ella Spence, to, who is the um, co president uh, for welfare and campaigns within the SOAS student union, talk a little bit about what what the union's been up to, uh, what activities and, uh, and their perspectives on climate justice. Ella, over to you. Thank you, Tom. Okay, just bear with me one sec. I've, I've stopped sharing, right? Yeah, yeah good. Is that, is that working? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay, perfect. All right. So yeah, like Tom said, um, I'm Ella. I'm the co-president for Welfare and Campaigns this year. So I'm just here to give you 
a little brief overview about the kind of history and current context of the student union organizing around climate justice and how people can get involved if they're interested. So um, the SU has always been a very key way for students at SOAS to mobilize around different issues, including climate justice, and also to hold the institution to account or push the institution when it's being a bit slow. Um, I think that relates nicely to what Tom said about not always being able to rely on our governments or necessarily our institutions to take the necessary action. So some of the ways that we've done this in the past past is um, by passing union general motions. So we declared a climate emergency in 2019, and I'll go into a little bit more of the details about this later. Um, we passed um, one in support of solar SOAS in 2014. Also, we had a campaign called fossil free SOAS in 2014, and that was also passed as a union general motion. And then in 2019-20, we had a demilitarized SOAS campaign, and we passed the union general motion in support of that as well. So I'll talk a little bit more about what those campaigns looked like. So Solar SOAS um, was born out of a campaign called SOAS Energy and Climate Justice Society, and they wanted to launch a project around renewable energy. And the idea was that it would be like a project with multiple stakeholders who would invest in solar panels to use up the space on the roofs of SOAS. So it ended up being a crowdfunded thing rather than the stakeholder format. But there are now... Um, 29.6 kilowatts of solar panels on the roof of the SOAS old building and um, this generates energy and also and that energy is used to generate a yearly green fund of 2000 pounds um which is which can be used by anyone in the SOAS community who wants to do a like climate justice or environment related project so if anyone is interested in applying for that please look out for it you can just type it in on the SU uh, the I think probably the SOAS website and it will come up we also had the yeah, fossil free SOAS campaign in 2014, um, which, which made SOAS be the first London university to, to divest from fossil fuels. Part of that was implementing a divestment plan with an ethical investment criteria, which was added to, the, to SOAS's ethical investment policy um, and used to like check their investments basically. Then in 2019-20, we had the demilitarized SOAS campaign, as I mentioned, and that emphasized the climate justice angle, as well as kind of neo-colonial and imperial analysis, um, kind of looking at the military as one of the most ecologically destructive forces globally. Um, and I'm pleased to say that SOAS have actually not renewed their contract with the Ministry of Defense this year. We had a climate emergency motion in 2014 and that declared yeah climate and ecological emergency and the framing of that was to acknowledge and recognize the complicity of academic institutions in producing the conditions um that like enable climate change um and to put it more centrally put climate justice more centrally into the su's policy and campaigning so that's something that we're always looking to be like held to account for ourselves as well um let me just see there we go, those are, the, those are the UGM motions. How, in terms of where we are now and things that people can get involved with now, we have an environment officer in as one of our 16 part-time positions. We're running elections at the moment, so if any of you are students and you would like to run for that position, please do. And if not, then you can contact them in future if you have projects that you want to get involved with. We also have the Common Ground Community Garden, which is a... Um, a communal growing space at the back of Dinwiddie House, which is one of the main halls of residence at SOAS. We have a food co-op, we have a herb society, we have a hiking society, and we have Solar SOAS, as I mentioned. And we used to have a cycle co-op, which was really great, and we want to bring that back. We also have um, Jack's role, who's in the SU as the Government's and Sustainability Coordinator of the Student Union, and he works alongside a project called Bloomsbury Green Thing to help make like operational changes at SOAS and work along SOAS UK to organise nationally, and you can find out more about that on the link there. So lastly, um, one of the things that we're looking to launch at the moment is a second divestment campaign that will kind of build on the original fossil free um, campaign that was it was helped run by a group called um, People and Planet and so the aim of the divestment campaign this time would be to look more closely at SOAS's 
investments um people and planet specialize in border industry um campaigns and things that look to divest from the border industry understanding that as a ecologically destructive force as well as one that is like very violent and harmful um and so part of that would be to adopt a publicly available ethical investment policy exclude border industry companies from their investments and fully divest from current investments in border companies within three years so if you're interested in getting involved with that or finding out other ways of getting involved with the student union please feel free to reach out to me um and that is a picture of the previous campaign from 2014 and that's all for me i have no idea what the time my timing was like there i hope it was okay well good thanks a lot ella and do yeah do encourage people to look up the, the student union website to see the, the different campaigns there and uh, and the contacts that she mentions as well they're all available online so now moving into some uh, um more exciting uh, areas i hope um one of the things that characterizes SOAS is its uh, interdisciplinary approaches and multiple disciplines and regional perspectives, as, as we'll be presenting tomorrow from some of our regional partners. But uh, Angela Impey, Professor in the Mus Department of Music here, um, is going to talk to us about green musicology and its relationship with climate change. Hi. I'm going to stop that for a minute. Is it, can, you, can you hear me? Is that OK? All right. So I'm going to start with a little clip. So this is a clip of, of um, African painted reed frogs that I recorded many years ago in South Africa, which is my home. And today when I listen to it, I'm, I'm immediately transported to the light, to the smell and the feel of the place, and to memories of familial relationships and to assemblage of ram random experiences. And I bring this example here um, to illustrate how sound is profoundly implicated in the way that we experience our world. Through so though sound is ephemeral, intangible, it is its enveloping effective character that makes us especially aware of proximity, connectedness, context, and thus assigns it a particular role in our social, economic, and political worlds. So in this presentation, I address the contribution of environmental arts and humanities to the COP26 agenda, um, bringing a cultural angle to our considerations of uh, climate empowerment, education, public awareness raising, as well as to inclusive climate action, equity and justice. And I'm not keeping up with my six, my 20 seconds here. So just to go back to the previous one. So um, environmental humanities, for those who don't know, um, is an interdisciplinary field of inquiry that brings insights and approaches of the humanities centered on questions of meaning, value, and ethics to bear on some of the most pressing challenges of our time. The field is grounded in the growing recognition that diverse human understandings about and activities in the environment, oops, um, uh, sorry, um, are critical factors in making sense of and responsibly inhabiting a dynamic more than human world. So the visual arts are an important historical chronicle of how people have seen the world and their place in it, whether represented as part of nature or simply representing nature as something separate. Um, and art and science were often one and the same in the history. In history, artists were key players in Islamic architecture, for instance, and the meticulous observations and biomimicry of natural forms um, was instrumental in the development of mathematics and medicine. And we can say the same for European 16th and century, uh, 16th uh, century uh, botanical illustrations. Uh, music demonstrates similar tendencies through its history, and the world is full of examples of aesthetic practices based on the sounds of wind, of animals and insects, and sounding out becomes a way to interact with or reflect on or assume nature's power through performance. So two uh, movements on, on natural sounds emanate from the biological sciences in the 1960s that are worth mentioning here. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1962, um, which is a study of the harmful effects of synthetic pesticides, um, produced a new way of uh, looking at uh, natural soundscapes. Oopsie, sorry. Um, um, a, a, a sound as barometers of environmental health. And the other was Bernie Krauss, um, who was an eco uh, uh, acoustics person. Uh, a second thing to consider was this uh, an album of some songs of the humpback whale, um, which became, I'm sorry, this is going way too fast for me. I might have to stop it. Uh, how do I do that? 
Mm. All right, uh, let's just carry on then. Um, it, it, so, as in 2011, we we uh, put on a we hosted an, an, a, a conference called Listening for a Change, which marked the beginning of uh, the eco musicology in the UK. Um, we looked at species uh, endangerment and its effect on the music in on music um, instruments. We looked at uh, the importance of uh, historical recordings and what that says about people and place and changing environments. We looked at indi indigenous environmentalisms and the role of music in indigenous movements. And we also looked at action um, by, um, by musicians and music industry. Since then, there's been a plethora of recordings Oh, excuse me, of, of uh, publications, articles, and conferences on ecomusicology with a specific focus on, on climate change. And these have brought important case-based studies to, uh, to our consideration of cultural entanglements between nature and identity. We've also made uh, activism and academic citizenship um, an important part of what we do, um, and looking at how to make ethno ethnography count and how to ensure that our work um, flows into policy and practice. Some of the challenges are this idea of a kind of epistemic dissonances, how to work across disciplines and to find ways to speak across those disciplines, um, how, to how to deal with climate politics and uh, co-produce knowledge in ways that are equitable, um, and how to retain uh, the integrity of our own disciplines um, while working across uh, across disciplines at the same time. Um, my own research looks at traditional phenological knowledge, and that is the, the, um, the knowledge of, um, of indigenous people or local peoples of uh, animals and birds in early warning systems. I've been working in Namibia, um, collecting songs, language, classification systems related to birds, and looking at ways in which these have operated through, uh, through time as early warning systems in ways that people have adapted to hyper-arid environments. Um, and I'll give you just a quickly, just a little example of that. All right, so more recently, I've, I've started to collaborate with uh, ornithologists and uh, um, conservationists to, to uh, develop a project that we refer to as remote and intimate sensing. So what I'm doing is uh, we, we kind of matching um, ethno-ornithological knowledge as it's in, embodied in songs and stories and rituals with uh, satellite tracking systems of, of flyways, asking a whole range of questions about how the coalition of that knowledge might lead towards better understanding of mitigation and adaptation to climate change. Um, in the music department through our culture industries program is partnering more with the, with the public sector. <laughs> this is impossible. Um, and one of the organizations to be working with is Julie's Bicycle, which is a fantastic organization that is, be, that is monitoring the carbon footprint of the music industry in the UK and has come with, up with a toolkit um, to try and direct uh, public organizations on how to uh, recycle and, and uh, um, manage their companies more effectively. So just finally, um, I just look forward to the development of environmental humanities at SOAS. We see the beginning of that and look forward to exploring vigorous interdisciplinary partnerships in embracing uh, SOAS's decolonizing impetus to guide our research and teaching on inclusive climate action, equity and, ju and justice, and to benefiting from networks and contacts to ensure a more effective flow of our knowledge into policy and practice. Sorry. <laughs> No problem. It's quite a ch quite a challenge to uh, <laughs> yeah to race race against the petrochemical. Sorry Kusa, about so. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no. It was it's also <laughs> fascinating. I don't. I speak for myself certainly that uh, it makes my own research sound rather dry and boring. So that's, <laughs> that's really inspiring and uh, fascinating. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Um, our next speaker, Palavi Roy, is going to uh, works with the um, Anti Corruption Evidence Consortium, uh, a major research consortium in in SOAS. Is going to talk a little bit about the governance underpinnings of, of, of climate change and of climate action, um, but also hopefully with a bit of a 
anti-corruption uh, lens and what they've learned from their research uh, linking uh, anti-corruption and climate change. I love you, all yours. We can't hear you. Yes, there we go. Yes, yeah. yes, here we go. Um, time's ticking, but yes, this is vineyards from research that we've conducted across sectors and countries where we actually had to dovetail uh, anti-corruption policy with issues of climate justice. So that's what we're going to present. And for some reason, uh, this is not moving according to Pecha Kucha, but uh, we'll just, has it moved? It hasn't moved. It hasn't, just right, just right, uh, right arrow it and it'll kick it, kick it forward. Right, all right, okay. Um, so how is uh, a transition uh, linked to the principles of governance? Any transition, certainly the, uh, the green transition is essentially about changing distributive rights. It's about who's winning, who's losing, and you have to collate and, and make trade-offs. And therefore, anything that's about distributive justice, anything that's about distribution, changing means of distribution, means that there is a need for the governance mechanism. And we're back to Pecha Kucha, thank goodness. Um, uh, this, this bit uh, focuses on the work in Nigeria, and everybody has heard about you know, the Niger Delta problem. It's, in, it's supposed to be intractable. Uh, most are aware of the issues of oil spills and excesses committed by the oil, big oil in, in the Niger Delta. But interestingly, there is this, this uh, industry called artisanal oil refining, which actually is intensely employment generating. It's completely illegal. It's under the radar. Uh, it's not supported by the government, but despite the, the terminology artisanal, despite it being illegal and under the radar, it actually provides a lot of employment. It's very organized and you know, even uses some fairly medium technologies. Uh, well, you know, it, it has to be said, this is extremely polluting. It has health externalities. All our speakers have spoken about the externalities of climate change and uh, uh, fossil fuel induced climate change. So this is, this is no exception. The Nigerian government has tried amnesty, has tried heavy handed violence, but neither carrot nor stick has worked. And why? Because salaries are extremely high. You, you know, the chart was missed, but uh, the average artisanal worker earns as much as somebody in the Nigerian Navy. And that, that says a lot. But then why does the community still persist with these kinds of activities around it? It doesn't benefit the community in any way. It, it's criminalized. But again, community members actually find gainful employment. And this is an incredible insight. Fossil fuels, big oil has destroyed uh, traditional livelihoods. But the irony here is that the community is now able to find some gainful employment when no other formal employment is available in these localities through stealing that same fossil fuel. So fossil fuel is actually linked to their livelihood, sustainable or not. This is something that keeps their home fires burning. And that's, that's, that's an important policy insight. So this is what we call networked corruption. Everybody benefits from it. Nobody wants to be the whistleblower. Nobody wants to stop it because uh, uh, I am not going to monitor someone else because that someone else is also part of my, my network. And we are all benefiting from so-called stealing, but it's not. And it fulfills a very important demand. Now, Nigeria is probably the most football crazy country in the world. And I want to make sure that my generator, and this, this photograph shows that, my generator is actually able to run and I will buy diesel produced in that so-called criminal artisanal oil refinery. Fuel for cooking is also a great source of demand, also for you know, petrol for cars. So it's not something that we can, we can stop and completely do away with. You can't, you can't criminalize it. Uh, you can't enforce more on it. So one strategy, as we said, is to de-link demand, solar panels. Uh, the second <laughs> strategy is mitigation. Mitigation in what sense? Provide basic healthcare services for the health uh, pollution, air and water externalities that are afforded. And the other is, of course, provide remunerative livelihood that again de-links from having to work in those AOI associated uh, activities. So the insight here is that top-down enforcement of more whistleblowing, of more enforcement and punishment is not going to work. Decarbonizing, criminalizing is actually not doing justice. We need to dovetail this anti-corruption and climate justice in the same package. And that's, that's essentially what our research in the Niger Delta showed. The Nigerian power sector uh, seems not to, to uh, uh, you know, mirror some of the issues of climate justice that we might think about, but here's why it does. We realize that the issue of corruption is intractable. It actually affects, uh, because there is absolutely no supply in the Nigerian power sector, which was recently privatized. SMEs are hugely vulnerable, and they're close to the point of shutting down. What do they do? They run these large diesel generators with very badly bad quality uh, diesel, but they have to keep running. Now, do you then say no more access to diesel? Well, not again. 
the policy here again was suggestion was dealing from the grid. Let's start 20 MG embedded plants disaggregated. The policy architecture uh, exists through CNG. Now that might not seem conventionally green, but given the baseline, Nigeria's self-generation is one of the highest in the world. And most of it is through very, very highly polluting diesel. Given that baseline, even CNG, while we wait for solar technology and storage to improve, is actually a huge improvement. Now, the next step for this research is actually, how do you design the finance? And finance is at the heart of it. Everybody talked about it. But how do you design finance without that getting captured? So many vulnerable countries, including Bangladesh, have seen their financing uh, uh, portion, financing pie being cut down because of corruption, because donors are convinced that, that the finance won't be uh, used for other, other reasons. And we do have a very excellent framework for green finance, and it's ambitious and it's necessary, but we need to develop according to local context, the financing mechanism, and we need to develop in a way that that finance is actually not captured. And that's why this issue of climate justice and the just transition is very, very closely linked to uh, uh, anti-corruption policy. You know, for instance, the social benefits of, of creating climate resilient uh, infrastructure is not immediately evident till the extreme event hasn't happened. Till that happens, what actually becomes more popular is I'm going to build infrastructure and provide contracts to my political patrons, or I'm going to actually capture. Now, one, one antidote to that was supposed to be community uh, uh, monitoring, and even that to, to improve transparency and accountability. And even that isn't very successful because usually it becomes a tick box exercise. Nobody's interested, the community is not interested, monitoring doesn't happen, very shoddy quality infrastructure for, for adaptation actually uh, gets constructed. Our research in Bangladesh uh, on, on climate change infrastructure actually showed that to do this, you have to involve relatively powerful members of the local community who have incentive to monitor dual use, uh, uh, dual use uh, infrastructure, for instance, embankments, which can be roads, uh, cyclone shelters, which can be schools, and then community monitoring is actually effective. So, you know, our research actually addresses some of the key concerns of COP26, like community involvement, finance for adaptation, political prioritization for adaptation. But for policy to be effective in addressing these, we absolutely need to make sure that the finance solution is designed in a way that it's not captured. Now, I know there was a huge lot for you to digest, and there's a lot on our websites, but um, thanks for listening. I think I'm done here. Stop sharing. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Philem. Brilliant. And again, you know, the ACE website has uh, all manner of uh, reports, but I do I do commend the one on um, corruption in climate change projects in Bangladesh. Uh, it's a really fascinating read. So do you hunt that out? So fantastic timekeeping, everyone. Last but not least, uh, I'll hand over to my colleague Roz Taplin, who's going to talk about visual art at the COP. She's been engaged in uh, in art and climate change world for many years. And over to you, Roz. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so I'm Roz Taplin from the Centre for Development and Environment Policy in the Department for Development Studies at SOAS. The area that I'm researching is on artists from around the world who have exhibited in parallel with the climate COPs and how they have communicated climate change concerns. The fusion of visual art and climate science in the work of artists fo focusing on climate change raises the question, how have the cultural voices of artists at climate COPs informed perceptions, communications and knowledge of climate change concerns? a knowledge of concerns with regard to their own countries. The slide here shows Argentinian artist Thomas Saracino's work at Copenhagen's COP15. For artists who have exhibited at COPs, their art is an exploratory and creative intervention into the political, an attempt to influence where other paths have been blocked. Nigerian artist Bright Ugo Chuko Eke also exhibited at COP15. As an African artist, he is interested in exploring water in ways that examine global human climate change and environmental issues. Ged Wheel, Paris-based street artist, installation of 140 acrylic colorful animals sailed, which sailed up the sand for COP21, was called a Noah's Ark for climate. They're intended as a visible reminder that many species are threatened by climate change. Also at the Paris COP, 
Danish artist, Danish Icelandic artist Oliver Eliasson, in collaboration with Minik Rosing, scientist, exhibited Ice Watch outside the Pantheon. Ice from Greenland's melting glaciers was transported for the installation. While at the Palais de Tokyo, an American team of artists led by Laura Kurgan staged the immersive installation Exit on the unprecedented numbers of migrants forced to leave their home countries with a dynamic presentation of data on climate change. Jarrett Lawrence's Deep Breathing investigates the climate impacts on Australia's World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef. In her work, the Sydney-based artist explores the potential for or lack of visibility of resuscitating fragile coral ecosystems. For the Madrid COP25 in 2019, Italian artist Lorenzo Quinn translated his very successful 2017 Venice Biennale work, Support, made up of monumental hands rising from the Venice Canal as a visual statement on rising sea level. <clears throat> Cuban-American artist Jorge Rodriguez Gerardo's mural at COP25 in Madrid was of Hilda Perez, a Peruvian leader of Andean and Amazonian Indigenous women. He chose her to symbolise their land stewardship preventing carbon emissions. Even though it is less than two weeks until COP26 starts, the art program from the COP is still evolving for the climate fringe as artists from around, outside the UK seek to find exhibition spaces to show their new work to the audience in Glasgow. Work already on show for the COP is a series of paintings dipped in black paint by Glasgow-based artist Ian Campbell. They were commissioned for COP26 by Christian Aid, Islamic Relief UK and Tear Fund to shine a spotlight on stories from those most vulnerable to climate change. Royal College of Art student Wayne Binti's Polar Zero installation on Antarctic ice presents air from 1765 embodied in ice cores, the same year that Glaswegian James Watt made improvements to the steam engine and started off the Industrial Revolution. UK artist Dornith Doherty documents seed banks from around the world to highlight human dependency on plant diversity for food. The installation Waterworks, created by Glasgow artist Gabriella Marcella, will greet 20, COPS 26 attendees arriving at Anston. Anderson train station adjacent to the COP. The focus is on extreme rainfall events that Glasgow is facing with climate change. US artist Joseph Rosano's installation on salmon depletion differs from other artists' contributions to the upcoming COP as it closely addresses the COP goals. The message is about wild salmon being in jeopardy of extinction across the globe. Artists from Tuvalu, the Maldives and Kiribati may unfortunately not appear at this current COP, but they have drawn attention to their climate change predicaments, both at home and at recent Venice Biennales. My own climate change art practice has involved analysis of the political discourse and language associated with policy responses. My recent Jamboreen drawings are on the plight of rainforests in Australia and globally and will be exhibited in the climate fringe. Albach and Mangan said in Regional Environmental Change in 2018 about Paris Agreement implementation, it will thus be of crucial importance to raise the profile of climate change issues, not only in the negotiation rooms, but also before the vast public audience. In answer to my question about the impacts of artists' cultural voices, they do appear to be contributing more and more in their own way to raising the profile of climate change. Thank you for listening. 
Many thanks, Ros, and we look forward to your reporting as someone who's uh, who lives in Glasgow uh, from the COP uh, as the weeks progress. Thanks ever so much. And thank you to all uh, the speakers. I hope you're um, joining me and thanking them uh, greatly for keeping to time and for um, for presenting th their views on COP26. Um, one final poll um, that I've set up and we'll put up the results too. But if you look in the chat box, there's a link there to uh, a menti link to vote on what you consider the most important outcomes of the COP26 meeting. Um, it might not be in the list that's there, but that's a, that's a place to start. I will um, put up and share the, uh... oh, it's already rolling. I will share my screen if it will let me. Nope. So it's financing commitments still in the lead, but emissions commitments consistent with 1.5 degrees is moving up on the inside. Will it take the lead? It's 1% away. Then neck and neck at 24%. There's an interesting wide range there. Obviously people are allowed to vote for up to three of these um, and the emissions targets have taken the lead on 25% and climate justice closely following the uh, financial commitments at 20 and 22%. As someone who's uh, working on loss and damage issues in uh, in COP26, I'm interested to see it's only only 5% there. I think it will it's a it's an issue that will gain traction and uh, an increased impetus within the COP. It's been something that's been uh, the conversations have been heavily closed down and there's real polarization of of views between the you know this is just about adaptation and on, on the other other side this is about reparation and compensation and i think there's a real um push and willingness on behalf of different parties to actually find some common ground uh, here at cop and beyond okay so we have uh, mitigation first let's sort the problem at source but make sure it's uh, in a climate just way and that there's sufficient financing to do so. Um, let's make sure everyone's voices are heard, but also recognizing that we need to adapt and take action on, uh, on loss and damage too. With that, I shall stop my share and say thank you to all the participants and thank you to everyone uh, listening. We will uh, turn these into videos or a long video and hopefully separate videos too and, um, and post them and we'll send the link to all the attendees, anyone who registered for this event. And please do come tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. We have uh, a series of speakers from across the globe, um, experts in, in climate change and, and indeed in, in COP processes. Do come along at 10 uh, to the link that you were sent, same link, I believe, um, and we'll see you then at 10 o'clock. Thank you to everyone and um, see you tomorrow. Bye. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom and Ed. Thanks, Tom. And Thanks, Ed. Tom, Ed, Sunil. And Sunil, yes. Oh, and Sunil, yes. <laughs> Sunil, Sunil, who's in the background. Not on his video, but uh, in the background somewhere. Secretly making it all happen. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we'll see you tomorrow, too, Sunil. <laughs>